welcome to a special virtual edition of the Skeptics Track at DragonCon. Make sure you are prepared for another hour of critical thinking. Hello and welcome to the virtual Skeptic Track. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, on our live streaming uh, uh, te telecast, I guess we can call it. Um, we, <laughs> I'm your assistant track director, Dr. Angie. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Today we have with us uh, Lynn Kelly. I have been so excited about you joining us today, Lynn. Um, she is uh, the author of two of my favorite books, uh, The Memory Code and Memory Craft. Memory Code is ab absolutely my favorite. In fact, this is my, my uh, autographed edition that I got from you in Australia <laughs> when I saw your mind-blowing lectures. So, um, and you have the American version, I hear? With uh, memory Code, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, there I you go. Got, so, so I haven't got the American edition of Memory Craft yet. It hasn't arrived here yet. Oh, goodness. Okay, Lynn. Well, talk to me about Scottish Balls. Oh, right. What, what a place to start. <laughs> we are talking, I assume, the stone memory balls. We'll go with uh, that, sure. <laughs> They're called stone carved balls. So if anyone Googles stone carved balls, they will get these. Um, they they look a bit like this. Mine are wooden, uh, but they're made of stone. And there's all sorts of theories on how they were used, which is to do with um, maybe for some game or some stupid thing that doesn't even match the archaeology of the use where. But if you compare it to memory devices used by indigenous cultures, and that's what this is all about, they fit the pattern exactly. But that's never been suggested. And the whole theory boils back down to uh, indigenous cultures have to memorize all the information they live on, live on because they don't use writing. Let's skip all this ritual who are praying to gods. Most uh, indigenous cultures don't even talk about gods. They don't worship or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, so you've got a delay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> They've got, we've got a, a misinterpretation of not including all the practical information they had to know. And because of that, they used memory devices. And we'll talk about all the different practical information. It is astounding the stuff they keep in their memory. And handheld devices, I've got some others we'll talk about, but handheld devices like these work a treat and you can find them in every single indigenous non-literate culture in the world. So there's no surprise that you can find them at these ancient monument sites like Stonehenge, although these are from Scotland, so circles up there. So I will waffle on forever. Do you want to get a word in edgeways? Not even a little bit, Lynn. I, can't, I could listen to you talk all day. <laughs> so what the whole theory is about memory devices, because if you're going to keep everything in your brain, huge amounts of information, memory devices will work and make a big difference. And the human brain has not changed enough in the mere 5,000 years since Stonehenge was built or the stone circles in Scotland. There's a thousand of stone circles all over. Uh, it hasn't changed in that 5,000 years enough for it to matter. Now, I'm going to dash back before we get to Stonehenge. I'm going to dash back to Australian Aboriginal cultures because it's Aboriginal people who have helped me most with this. But I've also worked with Native American, Pacific Island and African. But let's just look at Australian Aboriginal cultures. We have robust scientific evidence that they have stories of telling about landscape changes dating back 17,000 years. Mm. We have, we know we have a continuous culture here, not uh, dating back 65,000 years. And that means that the culture, it might have changed, but it's continuous and it's the oldest in the world. You've got other places where you might have biological links, but somebody else has moved in and added literacy. And then all of the stuff I talk about falls apart. 
So do you want me to go on and explain? Oh, please do. One of my favorite stories was when you showed these balls uh, or something like it to one of the one of the local uh, people who helped you with your book. He knew immediately what it was. Exactly. Um, that was the Towie ball, T-O-W-I-E ball from Scotland. It's sort of like this one um, in size and shape, but much more elaborately carved. It must have taken them hundreds, if not thousands of hours. And there's all these theories. And I showed a picture to an Aboriginal elder who said, oh, I'll have to explain this in a moment. Oh, they've done their Chiringa spheres. That's interesting. Now let me tell you about kangaroos. And off he went. <laughs> one of the world's greatest mysteries and it was obvious to him but neolithic archaeologists do not ask aboriginal elders what it may be and the key to why stonehenge was built exactly the way it was is that they must store information to survive and that information has to be stored in memory right it's so a very simple theory so a Chiringa is just a memory device. I've got, um, oh, that's my model one. Let's, let's show you the real thing. Oh, yeah. So this is an Aboriginal Coolamon. It's a food carrying dish. But on the back are all these markings. Mm -hmm. And those markings actually act as a mnemonic device. A, this is a girl's one. I wouldn't have been given, it's over 100 years old. I wouldn't have been given um, custodianship of it if it wasn't, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and they will learn the songs encoded with each of the marks over their lifetime. So this is a very precious object to them. Right. So a chiringa is a stone one that men used, uh, but they're very restricted. These are cultures that still exist, are still active, and uh, they are secret. And there's a very good reason for all this secrecy. I'll get rid of that and then we'll get back to all the other stuff. If I, it's called something different in America, telephone game, is it? Where you uh, whisper. Telephone, yes, we say the operator game, telephone game, things like that. Right. And you know things become corrupted within, you know, minutes. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just made this wild claim that we have stories that last 10, 17 thousand years yes That's over three times as long as before stonehenge was built you know that maths was terrible but don't worry about it <laughs> so the reason is they use secret business it's called secret business secrecy restricted and all indigenous cultures do it because by keeping important information secret and then only repeating it with elders present who know it exactly and making sure it stays absolutely accurate, you can retain information accurately. Right. Well, you need that so fidelity. You need that fidelity in order to maintain the uh, information that for things you don't use that often. Exactly. For example, let's have an extreme drought like we've just had in Australia. Mm. They, they often won't happen for you know, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, and people by that time will have forgotten which berry, you know, there's that berry over there. We never eat it normally. It tastes horrible. Mm -hmm. But you can eat it if you do this, that, and the other to it if you are desperate. But mm -hmm. don't touch that one over there. No matter what you do, it'll kill you. That sort of information is held at the highest level of restriction. So you get initiated. So the stories that we hear sound like children's stories for a very good reason they are and that puts down a structure and then with each level of initiation higher and higher levels are stored and there's research from here and from america um, and from africa that the highest level is where the information that is most desperate for survival is stored Agr trade agreements with other groups um and you know, what you can eat, what, what you do to survive. Mm -hmm. And that information has to be held. Right. So this has to be held accurately or you wipe out the whole population. Right. You've got wonderful stuff from the Pueblo of America. The, that's the group I, I studied most in, uh, of the Native American uh, because 
their dependence on corn is absolutely, you'll survive, they're down in New Mexico and so on, uh, where weather conditions and, and habitat can be very demanding. And their corn stories. So you'll hear all the stories of the corn mothers and the corn maidens and all their colors. And, and it sounds like mythology because it is, uh, but mythology is not fake stories. Encoded in that information is exactly how to keep corn from cross-pollinating, to keep the seven pure varieties, to plant them separately, to plant them at different times. And so that even if you planted all yellow corn, be lovely when the climate was right, have a bad year, you just wiped out everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have all of this stored. And so Alfonso Ortiz, who's a Pueblo writer, also worked with Richard I. Ford, who's a um, ethnobotanist, a scientist, who produced all the same information as science, why this works. If you read the two accounts, you can't even see the overlap, except that they each tell you to read the other one. And then if you read them together, you can see they are. So mythology is a method of storing information in the most memorable format, because the human brain loves narrative. So they will have wild characters, lots of sex, lots of violence. Everybody's either stunningly beautiful or terribly bad <laughs> because they are memorable. So the stories of the corn mothers and the corn maidens give you all the rules for survival, culturally as well as physically. And I have no idea where I started on that. No, you did fine. It, that was terrific. But uh, but it sort of brings me to my next point. So the um, I, I started with the with the portable techniques. I know that there are others with uh, rope tying and um, the carved yep. bowls, like you mentioned. And, and we'll get to the African lacasa at some stage it, because I get asked more about that than <laughs> anything else from Memory Code. But we'll get to that later. Right, and then uh, you know, and carved staffs and things like that. So those are all portable devices. But but you also uh, paid a great deal of attention uh, to more static ones, uh, such as the the circles and such, and a way to uh, to. And I think what you described was that as the um, um, hunter gatherers uh, needed to to transmit information to the other tribes or. They would, uh, they would gather at these sorts of areas. Um, can you tell us about that? Right. We need to get to the neuroscience of the human brain. Uh, we know that the human brain from the research done for the Nobel Prize winning in medicine 2014, but on place cells, the human brain associates information with place. It's its most reliable method. The other is music. And so there's studies with um, people with really advanced dementia. The two things that will bring them out, even if they seem to be unresponsive, is familiar music and place, familiar mm -hmm. places. And that's indigenous cultures sing all their information mm -hmm. and they associate it with place. So the ceremonies you're talking about, the massive ceremonies, are where all the information is performed. So instead of their songs being about, I love you, I love you, I can't live without you, <laughs> They're about, this is how you nap stone. This is how you hunt this particular animal. This is what this particular weather condition, down to details of the color of scintillation of stars, indication of weather, um, weather conditions, or the arrival of a particular migratory bird is like in New Guinea, they plant their taro. That's T-A-R-O plant, not, they don't plant taro carts. Uh, <laughs> plant it when the bee eater comes and does this you know so all that information is stored in songs and to make sure it's not lost they repeat it and that's what ceremonies are about essentially repeating and performing information because you remember performance way better than you remember a page of a textbook or a lecturer that's just waffling on endlessly and so dance is particularly effective mm -hmm. associated with music so it should be entertaining but primarily it should be pragmatic and useful in fact um Nungarai, who's a well prairie woman that helped me a lot with my research she said to me right at the beginning the elders were pragmatic old buggers we wouldn't have survived if they weren't mm -hmm. and so the research shows that a large percentage of of these songs 
are about practical information survival. So associating each song with a position in the landscape gives you a reminder and links the two most powerful memory devices we've got. And so you go from location to location and at each location, um, so those songs are then performed at ceremonies too, but in the landscape location, that location will sing the song about napping stone and where you get the best stone. The next location will sing the song about that tree and how the sap of that tree can be used to bind spears and so on, right through the landscape. We know from the Yanua people, they have 800 kilometers mapped out this way and they sing the 800 kilometers with locations right along it, giving them all the information. It's called a memory palace. Mm -hmm. And if you look up memory palaces, you'll find that they're invented by the Greeks. That's because everything, if you look into classical mm -hmm. studies, was invented by the Greeks. Absolutely. It wasn't. It predates the Greeks, we know here, by tens of thousands of years. And so you really have a memory palace where information is sung. It's called a temporal snapshot. Oh, you're a medical person. You know all this stuff. I remember patients by the room like I ran into a patient that I'd taken care of and she said I had a thing with my foot and I'm like oh yeah you were in room 12 or whatever and it, I remembered her based her illness based on what room she had been in so, so and it's the yeah. natural way our mm -hmm. brains work yeah but we don't use that in contemporary life don't get me started on what we should do with education why aren't we singing and dancing out our science, why aren't we acting out our <laughs> mathematics? Why are our corridors in schools empty when they could be memory palaces? There could be a complete history wall, complete geography around every country. Yep, yeah, I'll, yes, if we ever get to that. So, <laughs> well, you've done that in your hometown. You've made yes, the entire town your memory palace. It is. <laughs> and in one of the schools, we've set up um, complete memory palace for all of history which was really interesting <laughs> because, uh, no, let me stay on track. It's very difficult for me to stay on track. Um, <laughs> well, so it doesn't help that I've got, a, I've got someone texting me, get her started, get her started, because you're, don't get me started. And he's like, get, get her started, because I completely agree. I love to get you started. I love it when you start talking. <laughs> thank you, and thank you to whoever said that. <laughs> So you've now got the Yanua with 800 kilometres that have been mapped so far and recorded by um, researcher John Bradley at, at Monash University and with the Yanua people, obviously. And they're called song lines here in Australia. And my new book that's coming out in um, October is co-authored with Margot Neal, who's head of the Indigenous uh, Knowledge Centre at the National Museum. And we have written a book together called Songlines, The Power and the Promise. So she talks about the power from an indigenous perspective of these incredible links to country, they call the landscape country, these incredible links to country and all their knowledge, everything is linked to places in the country. Mm. And it's and promise because we don't have to give up any of our expertise in literacy and we can add this whole in and make it better. And she calls it the third archive. First archive being using the landscape and song and dance. Second archive being uh, writing and technology. Add the two together. The third archive is the most powerful thing the human brain can do. So it's not just Aboriginal people who do song lines. Native American pilgrimage trails are exactly the same. The ceremonial roads in the Pacific Islands, mm -hmm. the Africans do the same. The Inca sectors. You said the Nazca, have, have, the Nazca did it in the Nazca lines? Right. We, that's, I can see exactly the pattern in the Nazca lines. Okay. But with these Fair others, yes. we know because they told us. And right. even the Inca, right. it's been recorded by the Spanish that what they were doing on these sectors, C E Q U E S. Mm -hmm. They did all of Cusco lined out that way. At each location, there was a shrine. Now, I wish people had stopped labelling things tight, temples and shrines and assuming a religious stuff. You've got to eat before you can pray, frankly. <laughs> uh, so I found this was universal, which is no great surprise, given that that's the way the human brain works. And all the memory champions today, I'm now Australia's senior memory champion. 
<laughs> shuffle decks of cards and lists of binary numbers and useless stuff like that. But um, they all still use this technique because there is nothing more powerful. Cicero used it, um, St. Augustine, all these people. So if you associate memory palaces, use song and dance, performance and stories and portable devices, mm -hmm. um, I'll get to this one, my beloved La Casa. Uh, you are combining the most powerful memory methods that match the neuroscience of the brain. And by putting them together, you are optimizing your chance of memorizing all the information. So from the Navajo, for example, one study shows that they have 700 insects, all classified, all memorized, habitats, behaviors, a lot. Of those 10 are botherers, gnats, fleas, and things that get in their way. One they eat, the cicada. The rest are all knowledge for knowledge's sake. It is not just us white Western people that love knowledge for knowledge's sake. It is humans. Mm -hmm. And so 700 insects. Now add in all the other animals, the amphibians, the mammals, the birds, all the rest. Um, add in then the landscape. The astronomy and Pueblo astronomy is very strong, um, as is Australian Aboriginal astronomy, because you must keep a ceremonial cycle. You must keep a calendar. If you don't, you don't know when resources are available, where, when you're going to meet up. And at Stonehenge, we know they met in uh, the middle of winter by big remains and all sorts of archaeology. The archaeology reports are superb. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did they know because they came from all over the uk and western europe how did they know when to grab a pig and head for the party if they weren't <laughs> running a calendar well that's the perpetual problem is it you always want to know when to grab your pig and head for the party <laughs> but um absolutely <laughs> well and you bring up a good point like if they're celebrating in winter if they're gathering in winter and they want to communicate these th these things to each other salisbury plain is flat and windy and noisy how are they going to communicate this information to each other right there's all sorts of things called message sticks mm -hmm. but all the circles if you have an alignment with the um, solstice and with the equinoxes you're running a calendar and they will have a knowledge specialist uh, if you look then at the continuation from the neolithic on to a thousand years after Stonehenge, you then get the um, Druids and so on, who we know were knowledge specialists and maintained, especially astronomical information. But you don't need a stone circle to follow a solstice. You need one stick. So why is it a circle? Now, Australian Aboriginal people, you mentioned hunter-gatherers. They hunt and gather some, did some farming. We think there's all that sort of thing. They were not nomadic. They were mobile. That is, they moved between sites of resources and ceremony. So they needed navigation too. You try navigating without the knowledge of the song line. People get lost in Australian bush 10 yards. You're still in yards, aren't you? We, we Over there. yes. 10 yards from the path. The bush is so impenetrable, they get lost. Mm. But we know that Aboriginal people were navigating the entire continent. And there's over 300 language groups, but they were teaching each other the song lines so they could keep traveling if they had permission to go through. So there's this incredible knowledge and it was done using all these memory devices and the landscape. Now start thinking, we're getting to Stonehenge at last. Now start thinking, what happens when you start to farm and settle? You're no longer hanging laps right around the landscape. You're not visiting all those memory sites. But you can't just say, OK, I'm going to farm today. Let's sit down. Ah, who's got some seats? Uh, it doesn't happen like that. It takes hundreds of years to establish a ability to be dependent on agriculture. So they gradually settle. So they have to replicate those knowledge sites locally now there's something in between being mobile and moving around and um stonehenge 
called the Stonehenge Circus, if any, a great big monument, if any archaeologists are listening. Mm -hmm. But let's get to Stonehenge itself. You know those great big, in everybody's mind, I hope I've now triggered the image of great big, huge stones with lintels on top. Forget them. We're not going to get to them for 500 years. How long is <laughs> this interview, you said? Uh, you've anyway. got 35 minutes. <laughs> right. Well, not quite. We'll have no, to. We can go a little bit more, but okay. Yeah, we'll go. No, we'll go a bit faster than 500 years. <laughs> so at the beginning, Stonehenge was a circle of stones. Probably the archaeologists now are almost totally agreed that it was the blue stones from Wales. Now, they're about two metres high. They're not, the, the, those great big things in the middle did not come from Wales. They came from um, Marlborough up the road. But um, they would have been harder to move than the blue stones. Whether the blue stones came from Wales because the people came from Wales and brought their knowledge system with them, or whether they um, locals adopted that and blue stones are very blotchy and everything. So you've got a lot of things. You're a medical. What's the word starting with PA that I can never stay where you can see things like you see dogs in clouds? And oh, pareidolia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to pronounce it. <laughs> so blue stones are really good with that because they've got lots and lots of blotches. And so you've got a lot of memory device. You've basically got a full scale one of those standing there. Um, and so there's initially about 100 stones in a circle. The circle's about 100 metres across. If you're performing the ceremony in the middle, we know it was midwinter. We know England. I hope there's no Brits present. But uh, England is not known for its good weather. <laughs> and in the middle of winter, you're not going to hear anything from the middle out at the bank on the edge. But there's a ditch. The initial ditch was about two metres deep with a flat bottom. And this is key to my theory and nobody else can explain why they the hinges all have a flat bottom while the later iron age ditches are converted to v-shaped defensive ditches and the flat bottom i was sitting in a lecture theater going why on earth and realized it was exactly the dimensions of the lecture theater oh. the flat bottom was because they were performing down there because given the weather they have to be able to cover it the imperative is to perform those ceremonies because if you don't you can lose the information it must be repeated and it must be repeated with groups confirming that you've got it accurate and so there'll be private ceremony secret ceremonies and public ceremonies which is why there's ditches right around we can go into the details of the archaeology for hours but that ditch is critical they could cover it with skins if they had to People on the banks could see it. And it's white chalk. And they were down there with torches. Now, you're basically, chalk is a stone. You're basically getting the acoustics of a bathroom. I don't know if you ever sing in the shower. Always. But you've got this bright torch reflecting off the white, the acoustics. I mean, it must have been incredible. I beg my husband to dig me a ditch. <laughs> Where on earth would you put so it far. on your property? <laughs> I want one. <laughs> well, didn't you also say something about there was stamping on the on the wood pieces to, for the echo, yeah, for the pattern? In, in one of the hinges, they've got evidence because these are 5,000 years old and, mm. sto and chalk isn't a stone that holds, that it weathers quite mm. easily. Uh, but yes, there's evidence of wood down there. Mm -hmm. But... There's evidence, especially from Avebury, which is a much bigger circle, um, of the effort they made to make those bottoms flat. Um, not bottoms, bottoms, the bottoms of the <laughs> ditches flat. So, and so if you look at Avebury's ditch, um, it's a kilometre around you're, and up to 10 metres deep. Wow. You are talking a million work hours. Mm. They did not do that just for fun. No. And the theories about why there are ditches around, because they're not defensive, we know that, um, or the archaeologists know that, so mm. I believe them. Uh, they're not defensive. They didn't do that for no reason. One of the theories is to show that they could. They were not stupid. 
but the imperative, the practical reason, they have to perform these ceremonies and you've got an incredibly effective stage. So if you've been to Avebury, the great big stones that everybody's terribly impressed by would have been grossly overshadowed by this massive ditch. And then you've got all sorts of different stone circles and, and timber circles at Thurrington Wall. Anyway, back to Stonehenge, because the chronology is important. Mm -hmm. So you've now got an open circle with all these stones around. They're marked now, if you visit there, as the Aubrey holes with white things of, of um, concrete or something. About 500 years into their life, so we've done now 500 years quite quickly, I think. Yes. Uh, they moved those blue stones into the middle, had others, and then they put those huge sarsens, as they're called, right around. And there's research, some of the research only came out this week, but my book, if you read the memory well, code, actually <laughs> predicts it, um, that that made it incredibly secretive and restrictive and it's essential to keep have restricted locations so my theory then had a big problem because one of the criteria i've got 10 criteria that are all falsifiable if you find a single standing stone thing that you can't navigate like a memory palace the whole theory falls apart mm -hmm. there's a thousand of them already and none of them are like that and these circles are also all over America. They're mostly timber. They're in Egypt and other parts of Africa, Pacific, Asia. Yeah, everyone's using the same method. They're using whatever materials are readily available. So they've moved it into the middle. They've made it highly secretive. They're now living there much more permanently. And so you've got this restricted class. I've got no more public performance space that's not going to work my theory falls apart unless you add in what all the other all the archaeologists no other archaeologists all the archaeologists do and Durrington walls is a site three kilometers up the road and about which is you know an hour or two's walk at the most they've only just found a whole lot more uh, pits and things there that also entirely fit the theory i've been inundated with emails saying hey all this new stuff fits what you've been saying it fits perfectly <laughs> just a huge relief so at the same time as they moved those big sarsens in at stonehenge they built durrington walls and it's a kilometer long ditch again like avebury with some parts um, up to 10 meters deep all flat bottomed a million work hours just for the ditch and it's got small circles and big circles and big performance spaces and little restrict. So it's got everything, but there's your public space now. And there's evidence of houses and all sorts of things that aren't at Stonehenge. Mm. Because if you look at the Greek and Roman talking about, um, there's a, a school textbook called the Adherenian, um, Rhetorica Adherenium. Uh, that one of the things for a good memory palace is it should be away from interruptions in your everyday life. And that's exactly what Stonehenge was. So you've now got a, um, a memory palace, a restricted, you've got now a big public one because the population's growing. So my theory says you've got to have these sorts of things. And there aren't the stone balls like up in Scotland, but there also isn't that sort of stone. But mm. there are the Stonehenge chalk plaques. And I've examined these and they're handheld and they've got patterns on them just like this, just like this is a replica of one of the stone balls. Abstract patterns are way better than the representative. So whenever you see the caves in um, Altamira and Lascaux and so on, they always show you the beautiful horses and everything. They don't show you all the abstract marks. Mm -hmm. But the reason, and we know this because Indigenous people have taught us, the reason they use abstract marks is that you can add any amount of information to them. Mm -hmm. So you can start with something simple and you can interpret it in lots of different ways, depending on the level you're working at. Right. So right. I've got memory palaces with five different sets of data in them. And my brain will just take out the set of data at once at any given time. And I've got about 10 kilometers of palaces backing around as well as my portable devices. 
So that abstract symbols are actually more important than the pictures. Hmm. But if you start looking at those pictures in terms of knowledge, you'll find that the cows or the cattle on it have different hair levels or the horses indicating the different seasons. There's always information encoded there. Hmm. So tell us about your uh, that uh, African, what do you call it, the the little piece with the beads on it? The Lukasa. Lukasa, yes. L-U-K-A-S-A. -L and there's no um, practicing um, experts of this from, this is from the Luba people in, in West Africa around Niger and um, anyway they the devices look like this there are none in Australia this is one that's been made to my design but matched on ones in America there's some two at the Met uh, there's a couple at the Brooklyn Museum which is where I held one and this is copied but from one of those so I had read the research. Now, don't forget I'm a skeptic, mm -hmm. founding member of the Australian Skeptics. I had read that they stored vast amounts of information to this little device. Um, so it's beads and shells nailed on, bit of carving, tortoise shell on the back. They said they even used this. Now, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to believe that you can put an encyclopedia of information encoded to something like that. So in my best scientific method, I grabbed a bit of wood that they were building our veranda at the time. That's what our veranda is made from. <laughs> grabbed a bit of wood, glued on some beads and shells randomly, didn't even think it through, and then thought, oh, what will I try encoding? I'll do the birds of Victoria. We've got 412, 412 of them. And I have them in families, taxonomic order, the whole 412, encoded, <laughs> got it upside down, that's upsetting, <laughs> um, encoded to this piece of wood. I could not believe how effective this was as you touch each one. So there's the emu up there. I'm touching the beads falling off because I'm crap at craft. Um, <laughs> but it's sharp and the emu bill is sharp, so I left it pulled off. But let's go to the next one. I'm not going to do the whole 400. That is the duck's. And if you look very closely, I don't know that you can see, mm -mm. but there's a little tiny fleck on it that looks like a duck tail wagging. You've got to have a good imagination, but it's all about imagination. Mm -hmm. And the human brain does this naturally. There's 16 ducks, and I've encoded those in a story about a football game. The first is, you know, there's the swan, and one of our big teams is the swans. Uh, there's the magpie goose, one of the magpie Magpies. So it's a game of the magpies against the swans. It gets out of control. The Australasian shoveler buries all the dead. <laughs> uh, the musk ducks off um, with his musk cologne having sex in the bushes. <laughs> um, it's, so it goes on. So I've got this story that gives me the 16 ducks. Once I've got those names, and this is the way these knowledge systems work, once I've got those names, I can then add more and more and more detail to the story. And this is what we're not doing in education. Why not lay down these foundations in memory palaces, like all the countries in the world, all of history, all the chemical elements, whatever you want, give them stories, give them characters, like Boron to me is a really boring guy. Absolutely. Gray suit, you know, like politicians, gray suit <laughs> guy. Um, and then I can add all the information about Boron to this story. So then to test it, once I'd seen a real one in Africa and at the Brooklyn Museum, and it was very emotional holding that, I designed this one as they would have uh, on it, but for my information, and it's all about development of scripts. And it is unbelievably easy to encode, just choosing the shells and beads uh, basically encoded it for me. They are phenomenally effective. We've now tested these with kids as young as three. Mm. Uh, one little guy, Haku, has got a little one that he made for all the wattles, the acacias bush. And, he, and you should hear him say acacia dimbal. Yeah, anyway, he says it's so <laughs> cute. Yeah. So we've been testing these with kids. If you try and teach kids the nine local acacias, they're bored out of their mind, give them a bit of wood, tell them each one and we'll choose a bead. 
So one's the plowshare um, wattle. He made up a little story about a farmer and chose a bead that looked like a farmer. Um, and so it just works because the human brain works that way. It's tactile. You can sing the songs, you make the stories. So um, crap as my scientific experiment was, it proved that I was wrong. My skepticism was wrong. And so I've found these devices right around the world. And they're, in archaeology, they're usually listed as enigmatic decorated objects. Ritual devices probably had a religious purpose, uh, but not if you talk. So if you look at some of the Plains American, the Lakota, for example, have um, something that on a skin that looks like that, a winter count where each year they add a new symbol mm. uh, and recall the history, but also all the other information associated with it because that's their starting point. You then build up a story. So we've got these sorts of things at Cahokia in Illinois. You've got uh, timber circles, exactly the same dimensions as um, Stonehenge. They were not chatting to people apart from the 4,000 years difference in time. Mm and they didn't pop over to England, it's because it matches the human brain. That's the common factor. So at Louisiana, um, at Poverty Point, there's, there's no, tim no, no stone at all. The biggest stone's the grain of sand. Uh, when I was there, they've got ridges and they've got lots and lots of portable devices uh, that they call PPOs, portable um, Poverty Point objects. They found some holes, some post holes in the plaza in between the mounds. And I said, please make that a timber circle because then it fits my theory. They've, I then got email from the archeologist. Yes, it's a timber circle and it's same dimensions. Again, approximately a Stonehenge's original circle, nothing to do with communication, all to do with the brain. They've now got 27 circles mm. at Poverty Point. So we're getting the same pattern everywhere for the simple reason humans have got the same brain and they have to memorize vast amounts of information. So now can I tell you why I love the skeptics? Absolutely, 100% yes. Um, if you've got a wild theory like I've solved Stonehenge and you're a skeptic, your immediate in reaction is crap. Nah. Um, <laughs> Why would I have thought of this? No one else has. And so I got the Victorian skeptics here and said, I'm going to give a talk to you. I'm going to claim I've solved Stonehenge. This is what I'm going to say. This is the information I'm using. Please argue against it because it's derailing my PhD topic and my book contract that I had lined up at the time. And the Victorian skeptics were there ready to really, you know, another nutcase theory. <laughs> and their questions, apart from the fact I convinced some of them, which was very encouraging, their questions helped me polish it. I used the Victorian skeptics and the Australian skeptics, I think about five times, presenting the theory as it developed, saying, please knock it down, because I need every hole filled. And I was starting to go nuts. So um, my husband said, we can't afford a psychiatrist. We're going to uh, England, sit down with a Neolithic archeologist and nut this out. Cause I was keeping two PhD topics going at this stage. So we went and met Ros Cleal, Dr. Ros Cleal, who's archeologist at Avebury and lead author on Stonehenge in its landscape and uh, sat down with her. Now, she normally won't see people because she gets endless Stonehenge nutters wanting to talk to her. But because I came officially from a university, she had to uh, give me an hour mm -hmm. with a minder there ready to get rid of me. At the end of four hours, she said, and she does this, you're doing my head in. <laughs> um, can you come back tomorrow, give me something to read? Because she'd never thought about the intellectual achievements of Indigenous people and the amount of knowledge they kept. And she, um, memory code, you'll find she's endorsed it at mm -hmm. the beginning. Um, and she's a leading expert on Stonehenge. So I then 
because of her, I gave up my second one and took it full time. No journal would touch it. I sent the theory to a few journals. Re rejections within 12 hours. Mm. That's how bad it was. But when I finished and part of the, the um, issue was who examines the PhD, my supervisor gave me a choice of let's go, we could go safe to people that would, you know, be gentle, or we can go all out to the harshest we can find in the world, including American lead archaeologists. Uh, we went for the harsh, which was very scary, but their names on it mattered. Cambridge University Press then published it um, as archaeology. And so it's been checked and checked and checked and checked. And it works. You've just got to be a sceptic and be practical instead of going for this. It's a temple. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, that's sort of like um, answering a question with another question. It doesn't actually answer anything to say there's a temple there. Um, this you is say the ritual object. I mean, ritual just means repeated. Right, right. It doesn't necessarily mean it's religious. And uh, you talked a little about um, deeper prehistory, like... Uh, um, some of the fertility symbols, um, and I kept thinking Villas, uh, Venus of Willendorf, and and each one of those beads on her hair, ha what a perfect device that would have been to help exactly. remember. Yeah, and she's only this tall, so I mean it's not it, it would be completely reasonable to be portable, and th and that's twenty eight thousand years old. So, I know. Why do we assume it's fertility? Why? I mean, if you it's look a at a woman, the I guess, but. Yeah, and the Pueblo storyteller figure, who mm -hmm. is, and it's a woman with a whole lot of children usually hanging all off her. Oh, so you mentioned, yes. She's not a fertility symbol at all. She's a storyteller. She's educating those children. Mm. This assumption that it has to be with sex or religion, that's the only possibilities. I mean, the, the Pueblo Coca Perli, which is one of the characters. Ah, yes. Um, <laughs> which is all about sex. Now, sex actually is important. Mm -hmm. I don't know about to modern Americans, but to most people, <laughs> sex, is, sex is fairly critical practically as well as otherwise. And the Cocopelli stories were considered by the initial uh, white settlers to be vulgar and, and so he was banned. <laughs> uh, of course, Pueblo kept him going anyway. And still the contemporary Pueblo artists, I have my Cocopelli's up there. Sure. But yeah, uh, indigenous cultures aren't sort of hung up about sex like modern religions are. Hmm. So, and that's one thing I grossly underestimated in talking in memory code, and it comes out more in memory craft. Memory craft is the response to memory code was how do we apply these in contemporary life? Hmm. Uh, so, this is how to take all the different methods and apply them in contemporary life. And one thing I hugely underestimated was the importance of these characters and using characters to tell stories. But this came out really strongly um, when I was testing the theories in schools here in Australia. And so we started one of, because art is the other thing, art is used as a memory device right up to recently, up right into the Middle Ages, recently sort of from the Middle Ages on. So in one group school, of, primary school, 70 kids. Um, I'm just trying to watch the time because I can waffle on forever. They um, each created their own characters. Now we wanted to call them something because to call them Kachina, which is the Pueblo term or ancestors like Australian Aboriginal is actually offensive because we're not pinching their, we're pinching their concepts and intellectual achievements. We're not pinching their culture. Right. So we decided that the art teacher, Paul Allen and I, to call them uh, cheekies, to give them character until we Googled cheekies and got a lot of bottoms. So <laughs> we um, quickly changed. And Paul came up with the term rapscallions, and that worked. And you've never seen anything as cute as a seven-year-old talking about their rapscallions. <laughs> and by telling the stories, and they used each other's and made up stories, maths tables, for example, uh, they would turn into stories. Everything, the order of the planets, by adding in a character, mm -hmm. a character to whom they had an emotional attachment, suddenly it became memorable. Mm. And that's something I'd underestimated just how valuable it was. A lot of them used their pets. 
they use dolls and, and bears. I use bears for French. Mm. And so I've started testing all these theories. Um, and at school, the hardest subjects for me were foreign languages. And I kept getting asked, how would you use this for foreign languages? So I decided to take on French, which I failed every year at school. We had to do it, to do science at uni. And um, then I decided to do Mandarin as well, just to make life really hard. <laughs> and using these memory techniques, I'm not only coping with these languages, I'm loving every minute of it. I studied Mandarin on uh, uh, like a game format on uh, an app on the phone, and uh, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, I got I got very far into it. Uh, studied for a couple of months and was able to hold simple conversations. And uh, it, I would love to have continued. I just circumstances made it not really reasonable. But um, but I'm so excited to hear that these things can be applied to foreign languages as well. And. I've got memory palaces for both French and Chinese, but I'm using them completely differently. Mm. So French, I've got verbs and all sorts of things in, in memory palaces. Uh, but for Chinese, for Mandarin, I've got the characters all have radicals. Mm. So I have a memory palace for each of the radicals. And then if you take Zhen, the person, mm -hmm. which way it goes, yeah. uh, then I associate with it the words and so with that house hmm. this palace goes 5k so i get my exercise going around it and so i can associate the words with it and i know all those radicals mm -hmm. and i can always find something on that house that resembles the radical hmm. but the yeah. other thing with mandarin is all the syllables have a given um initial and a given final um initial and final bit like mian Mm -hmm. has M at the beginning and I-A-N. Right. So I, there's a limited amount, which, uh, number of possibilities, which isn't true in other languages. And so I've used a thing called a bestiary. And this is a medieval method of using animals. So their bestiaries were memory devices, using animals. So for M, I use a marmoset. And I-A-N, I use a magician. Mm -hmm. So if I want to do M-I-A-N, which is part of... Um, Nian Bao for um, bread. I have my mama set tossing cards all over the place. Um, and um, Biao is a bird scratching with blood everywhere. So on my loaf of bread, I have this mama set with its cards and this bird scratching blood everywhere trying to get at the mama set. And that image gives me Nian Bao for bread. After a while, you don't use the image anymore because you know the you word. Just know it. But it gives you a hook and sure. visual alphabets and bestiaries um, from medieval are two things I use all the time. Bestiaries I use for memorizing people's names. <laughs> How about that? Well, we've got, we've got a couple of questions from the chat. Um, for recalled information that's updated over long periods of time, are the details from an older version of the narrative typ typically retained while still relevant, valuable and practically useful? It depends. You'll find, um, so if I want to update information, I change the story. I update the story and eventually you lose the original mm. unless you want to keep it. So that's why the stories we know from very ancient ones in Australia are about landscape changes because they use the landscape as the memory device. Mm -hmm. Other stories um, which are based on constantly changed because uh, the stories about the Europeans arriving and, and um, trade with the Macassans hundreds of years ago from Indonesia. So it will depend what you want to keep and what you don't. But the stories about landscape and big events will stay because they're at the base level. So you can update it, you can keep the original information, or you can change it, and it'll depend on the practicality. Mm. So studies of the Pueblo, for example, there are examples of things they've learned that they've maintained, but other things that have changed and deliberately creating mythology. Don't think this is us white people know what they're doing, they just do it. Um, that's what working with Aboriginal people on this Songlines book, that they know perfectly well what they're doing. And there's evidence of it deliberately being done in order to memorize. So 
don't think that there's any intellectual difference. So yes, it depends on the information and how valuable it is. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, you seem to speak about memory code usage as opposed to religion, but might they not have been intertwined carrying forward both knowledge and behavior codes? Absolutely. Um, thank you very much for that question. Yes, I shouldn't keep dismissing religion. Religion is part of it. Um, Aboriginal people don't pray to gods, there are no gods, but there are all these characters and they'll say whose stories we tell. Um, so, and there is a whole spiritual dimension. The reason I focus on the scientific is because we are all looking at the same thing. We're looking at the same stars, the same landscape, the same animal behaviors, uh, the same navigation. So that gives me concrete scientific stuff so yes i should not dismiss religion of course they have religious stuff and it's all intertwined and that's the other thing they do that we don't is we've separated our knowledge domains art has nothing to do with science does it they draw their science they sing it they dance it and they have a lot of science they have to and our scientific institutions are working with indigenous people now um getting out this information but they intermesh it and so uh, I'm back to why aren't we drawing and singing our science at school too? Why do we do that? And why is art and music, this is coming as a physics, ex-physics teacher, uh, why are art and music on Friday afternoons and on the peripherals and the hardcore, let's whack it all together and have fun. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yes, I, I have sort of dismissed it because that's not part of my research. I just acknowledge it the spiritual side yeah what, what are the things that you found um uh the most resistance to that you proposed this is interesting i haven't had any resistance i expected it my theory on stonehenge does not disagree with the current theories there's theories about it being an astronomical observatory theories about it being to do with death all this indigenous cultures whack the lot together so I'm not arguing that any of those, th oh, I mean, wizards and ley lines and all that can go, <laughs> but the serious archaeology uh, theories, I'm not disagreeing with any of them. They're, I depend on their reports and I don't argue with any of the reports mm -hmm. because um, their theories all fit. I was very worried as a white academic talking about Indigenous stuff I had to be very careful. I don't retell stories. I don't pretend that I have more than a glimpse into the cultural and spiritual side. Two minutes. But the reaction to the intellectual stuff has been fantastic, which is why the National Museum through Margot Neal invited me to co-author, this is the lead on a series on indigenous knowledges, uh, to co-author with Margot herself the initial one. So no, haven't had any problems. I've been waiting for it, but it's been a couple of years now, so I'd expected. There's been a sort of silence. Um, I'm sure they went, uh, of course. <laughs> I'm sure that they were immediately but, just, uh, of course. But on uh, the Indigenous stuff, the reaction tends to be, oh, wow, oh, now hang on, <laughs> duh. Um, <laughs> which is exactly the reaction I want. Absolutely. Well, so thank you so much, Lynn, for joining us. We, I just can't even tell you how happy I am that you were able to join us. I hope that you can join us again in the future. Uh, I'll give you the last, uh, uh, last 30 seconds or so to, for a sh shameless plug. If you have uh, any place where people can get in touch with you, your books. Well, Website, if you Google my name spelt correctly, L-Y-W-N-E-K-L-L-Y, -L -L nice rhythm there, married well just for that. <laughs> There's the memory code, uh, which has got the archaeology, memory craft, the practical, but the American cover is quite different. And you've got the Australian cover of the memory code, <coughs> which is also in Chinese and Czech or something, and <laughs> memory craft's going into Russian at the moment. How exciting. That's very exciting. Yes. So... Uh, so, yes, it's all on my website. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, everyone, who joined us today during this live uh, Skeptic Track uh, broadcast. Uh, we have to do Dragon Con because of COVID. Please, please take care of yourself, social distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, 
and uh, get Lynn's books. Those will keep you busy uh, in your house for a while. You'll start to build your own memory palaces. Exactly. So, <laughs> it's fun. Absolutely. So we'll see you in the morning. Uh, we have uh, some wonderful lectures over the next two, three days. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for Calico Cove uh, uh, Studios for letting us stay. Thank you, Mark Ditzler, Derek uh, Colanduno, and um, we'll see you tomorrow. I'm Dr. Angie. Bye-bye. As fun as all this streaming content is, we sincerely cannot wait to see you all in person again next year. Remember to stay healthy and safe until then. Wear a mask when interacting with other people out in the real world. Want more SkepTrack? Get more than 10 years of Skeptics Track programming at our video archive video.skeptrack.org